Hello, uh, I like to, oh. Hello, I'd like to welcome all participants to this uh, panel on key pillars of the emerging global data space, as we called it. And uh, we perhaps uh, use that term for today to describe where we're heading to. My name is Peter Wittenberg. I worked for many years in the Max Planck Society, and I'm now engaged in the FDO forum, as you can see. Well, um, let's talk today about this um, uh, beast uh, called, which we called global integrated data space. And we hope that we might be able to establish this in 10, 20 years. And some even may uh, think that it will take longer. The question then is now whether we dare to make statements about this space. It sounds a bit like magic, but let's give it a try today. So it's well known that uh, phases in human evolution can be characterized by changes in communication patterns. And the fundamental impact of changes due to the introduction of printed language are widely known. So you, you see some, uh, some points made here, uh, but I think it's well known. Therefore, we are now in a phase, or we are now in a phase where digital machines will replace in, uh, humans and processes even stronger. Therefore, some predict that computed language, as we may call the next phase, will cause changes as great or even greater. And if you read uh, uh, well-known books from, for you maybe, from Harari and Florini, whom we have today here, uh, you see questions like, what might these changes be, how to prepare for them, and so forth. Well, when trying to answer such questions, it's always good to briefly look at where we are now. So let me just uh, refer you to some trends. I will not go in detail here, you know all them at the top. And it's also clear that we can identify an increased photos of a focus on data in science, business, and society. But we also know the, uh, the huge roadblocks hampering our data work. So I will not go through uh, all of them, but just to mention a few, heterogeneity, 80% waste of time and money, no trust in reliable mechanism, no concept to achieve a stable and manageable domain of digital entities. I think the last is most important. Which means, of course, if we want to establish such a GIT, such a global integrated data space, we should overcome these deficits. And, uh, and uh, if we want to do this, this implies building a global infrastructure. If you read the book from Thomas Huge uh, about uh, the history of electrification, I can really recommend reading this. You will see that he makes a very good analysis that if you are building infrastructures, large infrastructures, you have, uh, this only will work if you have a tight synchronization between three dimensions, politics, technology, science, or economics, uh, depends on where you are. And we believe if you want to build this integrated domain, you need an independent standard core. Well, as the FDO forum, where I'm part of, we believe that the fair digital objects are such an independent core concept. It implements the fair principles, it enables persistent structuring of uh, the domain of digital objects, and it offers built-in security mechanism to just mention a few points. The, uh, but just to, and let me just add a few words on the FDO forum, not to, uh, to uh, bother you too much. It's an international platform of experts further specifying the fair digital objects and coordin coordinating all implementation activities. We're working now closely together with the German standardization organization DIN, which is closely linked with ISO. And we hope that we will gain uh, um, acceleration by this collaboration. And we choose for a simple startup governance to just do what we need to do, further these specifications and the implementation coordination. The FDO forum will need to check its concepts always against the, the needs of data producers and, and, uh, and users. Therefore, we need to interact with different stakeholders again and again. And this panel is just meant to look beyond the daily challenges of those people who work hard on infrastructure building. 
We will continue the interaction with you, with all who are interested. So we will prepare something on the website. And in this context, let me refer you also to the first conference on fair digital objects in October in Leiden, um, which is the city of science in Europe. Well, let me briefly mention the session setup. You may have seen that. So we will have four sessions today. Uh, we call them overall view, science view, technology view, policy view. And as you have seen, we have uh, uh, achieved to get ex excellent speakers for all these uh, for all these uh, uh, sessions and also excellent commenters who will kick off the discussion. Finally, George will present some summary statements. Well, let me now stop here and turn over the microphone to Christine and Dimitris and let's wish us an excellent panel discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, now I would like to invite our first speaker, Professor Luciano Floridi, and if you have slides, you're welcome to share them at this time. He's the Professor of Philosophy and Ethics of Information at the University of Oxford and Professor of Sociology of Culture and Communication at the University of Bologna. His areas of expertise include digital ethics, the ethics of AI, the philosophy of information, and the philosophy of technology, topics on which he is inter an internationally renowned authority and has published more than 300 works. He is deeply engaged with emerging policy initiatives on the socio-ethical value and implications of digital technologies and their applications, and collaborates closely on these topics with many governments and companies worldwide. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Um, thank you, Christine, and thank you, everybody, for, for the invitation. I, I hope the technology is working okay. Uh, just a nod would be great. Uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, you should be able to see my slides and um, hear me and see me, uh, hopefully. Um, just a warning, uh, we have had some ups and downs with electricity in this small village in the middle of nowhere. So if I disappear, <laughs> it's just because someone has unplugged the whole uh, network of electricity, not just uh, not just the web, but uh, hopefully, fingers crossed, has been repaired, so we should be okay. Um, I think uh, Christine has um, forgotten to mention one fundamental point, uh, which is, is this philosophy is going to disappoint you. Uh, which is important, uh, always to add at the end of the presentation. Uh, because um, um, uh, when Peter and, and George uh, very, very kindly um, uh, asked me to uh, give this presentation today, um, uh, they said that, that I, I was supposed to you know, kick uh, the ball, uh, philosophically speaking. Uh, and so um, look into the future, uh, be uh, quite ambitious in uh, overviewing this and that. And I tried my best, um, but since I'm addressing uh, top experts in the field, the likelihood that I say something that is either obvious or obscure, um, or at the same time, both obscure and obviously obscure uh, is high. So uh, forgive me for that. With that out of the, uh, out of the way, um, I know we don't have much time and uh, uh, I uh, look forward to uh, listening to, to Sabina. Hi, Sabina, by the way, <laughs> uh, neighbor uh, over here. Um, and um, uh, I organized my slides into two, roughly two groups, um, two blocks. Um, the first half, and I'm gonna show you uh, some slides pretty soon, um, is about uh, sharing some uh, general, uh, I hope not too generic uh, points in terms of interpreting the development of this data space or spaces and uh, how we got here, uh, but I know you know, and what we can expect. The second half is um, a bit of a deep dive. Uh, again, we don't have much time, so it will be a quick deep dive into, um, uh, uh, shall we say something rights uh, and permissions that uh, are crucial in this space. And I'll try to make that um, uh, somewhat interesting um, by linking it to the fundamental operations of a Turing machine. Uh, but before uh, telling you too much and spoiling the rest of all the slides, um, I know I know we all know, and this is just to warm up after at least over here uh, the coffee. It is now important to look at the right hand side. What I really normally care is the bottom left is when we started having all this data, uh, and that bottom left might actually be 2010 or maybe I don't know. Uh, 200, it doesn't matter, um, it's it just this generation. Uh, we haven't had this before. And whatever happens on the right-hand side, we know that 
it has started recently uh, and the amount of data we have is just going to increase um, this is one of the gazillions of, of pictures you can find uh, on Google. Uh, so um, remembering that uh, this is our problem, uh, I think it's also uh, important to stress that old solutions that might have worked in the past may not work so well now. Hence the need, for example, of uh, uh, a clear approach to digital objects and so on. So with this uh, out of the way, um, what I'm going to uh, argue as a very, very general point, which I will uh, pick up again at the end of this short presentation, is that what we are looking at now is not so much uh, technical, as in technological and scientific, uh, or even uh, legal in that sense of technical, but governance problems when it comes to uh, the space of data in general, or the digital revolution even more broadly. And by governance, I mean something that Plato had already formulated. Now, nothing new uh, under the sun here, control and direction. You need to control your ship and you need to know where you're going. Hence the picture, which actually comes from the Republic. Now, uh, it's not the, the, the most recent magazine you can find on an airplane. Um, governance is everything here. Uh, and uh, uh, in order to understand what governance means, we need to understand a little bit better how this data-related revolution has happened. And uh, what is happening to rights um, and permissions within this space. So because of Plato's uh, metaphor that uh, the best person to guide or, or, or direct that particular ship is a philosopher because a philosopher knows the stars uh, and knows how to navigate. I think the, uh, a quick way of presenting the following slides is just to uh, look at some dotted uh, spots in the sky, so, so to speak, some stars to get oriented in the governance of the digital revolution that has generated this data space, which is growing under our eyes. I'll do this uh, rather quickly, uh, a few slides just uh, with a few uh, keywords because we don't have much time. Uh, so the digital revolution is hyper-historical in um, a very simple sense. Uh, history begins with the uh, essentially invention of writing roughly 6,000 years ago, uh, over here. Oh, by the way, writing has been invented uh, four times in four different corners of the world. Um, it was only one when I was a kid and it was also always around here, but of course, China and, and Mexico and so on. We live uh, for a long time, uh, historically, uh, namely uh, in relationship with uh, ICTs, uh, Information Commission Technologies, um, and that relationship has become a dependence now, uh, increasingly so. Uh, hence, becoming even more historical, not less historical than in the past. For well, anyone who has read uh, books like The End of History and so on, uh, they probably realize where I'm going uh, with this. So we are depending even more uh, on the ICTs that we have been building. Um, this dependency is not a matter of communication. I still find scholars around, uh, normally uh, my age or older, they think that you know, the internet is part of the communication, uh, uh, mass media revolution, newspapers, radio, cinema, and internet. Not really. You don't leave on newspapers. You don't leave on TV, but you leave on the space of data. You live inside the space that we are inhabiting right now. So it's more than just communication, it's an environmental uh, change. That's why, for example, in terms of uh, what can or cannot be done uh, legally, it makes a huge difference whether you understand, say, the web or, say, social platforms as part of a communication revolution, where freedom of speech is fundamental, or as part of an environmental uh, revolution, where, for example, respect or privacy is equally important. Once you get this uh, digital revolution as hyper-historical and environmental, uh, meaning that it's building a world around us, is also more than just that, because it's also creating new forms of agency. New forms of agency, they are not new forms of intelligence, but they are new forms of agency. It's a bit like discovering that uh, we have not just us, but also dogs around us, or uh, there is us, dogs, and not bots. This again would deserve uh, a full lecture or even more in a different context. Um, I leave it there uh, as a point of reference uh, for maybe another time. Um, new forms of agency uh, generate, of course, uh, different, different problems from uh, new forms of uh, intelligence. 
our experience uh, in the world has become an on life experience. Uh, it doesn't make any more sense, like these kids, for example, to ask them whether they are online or offline. Um, that is from the 90s. If you ask that question seriously, you are out of sync with uh, the way the world is developing. Um, no one uh, in his right mind uh, would actually ask, are you, you know, uh, uh, online or offline in that sense in which you, know, you would connect to cyberspace a long time ago and then disconnect. Our experience has become increasingly uh, in more and more corners of the world uh, on life. Of course, um, this is normally the right time to be reminded that there are uh, hundreds of millions of people who don't even have uh, clean water to drink every morning. I know, but their life is determined by those who do have that drinking water. The life of those who are not living on life is determined by those who actually do. Now, the life of those who never made a telephone call is determined by those who actually made a lot of telephone calls. So it's not that I don't know, but I'm stressing this particular aspect. It also means that we are re-conceiving uh, ourselves differently. Uh, the digital revolution is also uh, a self-understanding um, uh, revolution. Uh, I summarize this as a fourth revolution. Um, because I've been building it uh, on um, three previous classic, not textbook kind of revolutions put forward uh, actually in that uh, one, two, three by Freud himself. Freud at some point says, no, I'm bringing you a third revolution. The first one was Copern Copernicus. We're not at the center of the world. So that was a very nice place where to be. We're no longer there. Big revolution. The second revolution was Darwin. We're not at the center of the animal kingdom. Um, so that was another misplacement. Um, Freud says, look, I'm also bringing you a third revolution, which is about mental space. We're not at the center of the mental space either. I'm adding just a fourth in terms of Alan Turing because we're not at the center of the space of data or infosphere either. We have all those bots, for example, that do a lot of things, sometimes better than us, um, uh, usually more efficiently. And I said, not forms of intelligence, but forms of agency. They can do and achieve goals uh, with great success. So there is a fourth revolution in our self-understanding, and all this is brought about by the cut and paste ability of the digital to transform things that in the past we thought were unified, um, for example, the territoriality of the law into completely separate things. Today, uh, we no longer speak about the territoriality of the law because there is some space. Or things that were completely detached, for example, my information and my identity, which today, you know, in terms of data subjects, at least according to European legislation, have been glued together. So the cuts and paste uh, of the past, which gets you obviously the picture uh, that comes next. The more you can cut and paste, the more design makes a difference. If you can cut and paste a lot, then clearly you can also reorganize uh, and put together things very differently. So today, digital innovation is above all a matter of design. It's not so much a matter of um, inventing or discovering. The other two major forms of innovation. Of course, invention and, uh, and discovery are still there. Obviously, it goes without saying. But what is driving uh, all this is more design than anything else. So it would be easier to describe our age, for example, in terms of the age of design rather than the age of discovery or the age of invention, as we did in the past uh, with other ages. Moving forward, uh, again, with a, a bit of a, a fast pace, um, because the problems that we are uh, facing today, given all this and what I said before and more, um, are, of, of course, uh, global, um, what we need uh, is uh, more cooperation. The more complex the world is becoming, uh, including, for example, the whole uh, data space, uh, the more cooperation would be required uh, in order to cope with that. By this, I uh, mean, by a simple analogy, that is no longer sufficient to have a single individual go and push that car that is not moving. You need to coordinate with at least three more people. And it doesn't make any sense that I go, that say Peter goes and George goes when we want, if we want, and we feel good about it because we have done our duty. That is useless. Unless the three of us coordinate, there would be no way of moving that car. Most of the problems we have in terms of say, social equality, international taxation, global warming, et cetera, are of that nature. They have maximum degree of coordination in terms of complexity, therefore requires all the stakeholders. That's where the digital comes in. That's where the data space can actually make a difference. More coordination in terms of efforts. You must probably uh, get that, uh, uh, speaking especially to some uh, business people normally, um, at this point, the digital is not 
really the cherry on top of the cake is the cake. Is the cake for our society, is the cake for our environment, is the cake for our business. Uh, is what makes a difference in these three things. No, humanity, society, the environment, and how we grow in terms of uh, uh, more wealth that we can distribute better, much, much better uh, across the world, remembering those people who didn't make a telephone call, don't have uh, clean water uh, this morning. Once the, uh, the digital uh, is seen as uh, not the cherry but the cake, then there is a way of describing a new human project of the 21st century, the green and the blue. Meaning the green of all environments we inhabit, not just the uh, biological environment, but also this environment, right, right here, the urban environment, the social environment, the economic environment, any, any place where we spend our time, that is our environment. With the digital, remember the cake, um, the digital at all levels, you know, from uh, the digital objects we discussed today to you know, AI, which I mentioned briefly, the IoT, uh, the social uh, media and platform and so on. So this is the uh, as well marriage that we want to have. The blue is uh, or should be uh, uh, green's best friend. It also leads to new jobs. I mean, again, uh, a big chapter for another day. Um, but um, the very idea that all the colors are disappearing, uh, the brown did, uh, the blue are on their way, the white are being challenged. Well, what other colors are left out there? The green color, so to speak. Uh, there will be increasingly more and more demand for people who actually can design, construct, develop, implement, manage this huge space uh, that we are building. Remember the very first picture? Uh, stewardship, uh, to put it broadly, uh, will be in huge demand. Uh, and that's where we don't find people, uh, where we have millions of jobs, not hundreds of thousands, millions of jobs around the world, uh, but we don't have uh, the skills yet. Too fast at the moment, but we will get there. And this is the second part, and I'm going to be uh, rather quick, so we're coming to the as we're landing of uh, this uh, quick uh, presentation. I like to introduce it with these three uh, keywords, but this is the slightly deeper dive. The other uh, slides were more like kind of touching points of, uh, for uh, potential discussions. This is going to be a little bit more, um, slightly more um, specific. Uh, tell you something about operations uh, very briefly, because I know that everybody knows that point uh, by heart, and then permissions and rights and how that uh, generates uh, different kinds of problems for uh, the data spaces we want to build. You must have seen this a million times, so <laughs> I'll skip really quickly. This typical Unix kind of uh, uh, read, write, execute permission classes. Um, I like to stress the read and write. Uh, the execute is what the machine does. I know that in uh, Unix we need to give, you know, say, user or group uh, permission uh, to operate in that particular way, uh, the X in execute, but there are good reasons uh, to discuss if you like. Uh, to ignore that for a moment, no, ignore the execute for a moment. Just concentrate on the atomic, technically speaking, operations on read and write. Well, these are the two operations that we find in any Turing machine. But if you look at the description of the six atomic operations in a Turing machines, there is no execute there. Because it's the, it's the machine that is executing by doing one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, it has, uh, of course, uh, some kind of table that is uh, checking and read and write, move and move, change state, hold. So if you allow me for a moment uh, um, to uh, exclude execute as one of the atomic operations we want to check and concentrate only on read and write, is there anything else as basic as and not transformable into a read and write operation? in our own way of interacting with data. Um, this is just to remind you that whatever else uh, you're going to check in terms of vocabulary, approach, uh, you know, SQL server terminology, groups uh, terminology, et cetera, it still goes all the way down to read and write. Create, read, update, delete, et cetera. Mind that therefore read and write have to be understood rather broadly. You know? read also in terms of access, identify, etc. And write could be edit, delete, update, and so on, but still read and write. So we've got two. Is there any other element that we need to include in terms of operation? I'm getting there, have a bit of patience. I think we need to add at least one more. There's one more basic operation that is broadly understood, transfer. Data mobility, portability, etc. goes under that particular uh, label. 
you can't have portability under read and write, uh, not as we have defined it before. So once we have these three fundamental atomic essential operations, that is our no agency in a data space. One more step. In uh, the logical predicates, uh, theory of uh, relations, uh, we normally talk about uh, relations having um, uh, a satisfiability by n number of things. Uh, Mary is taller than Peter requires two, it requires A and B, Mary and Peter. But Mary sits between Peter and John requires three, Mary, Peter, and John. So they have, no, they are binary, ternary, they have a arity relations. And you just wonder, okay, how many elements do I need in order to satisfy the arity of these relations? To be between is arity three. Taller than has arity two. Now with this little refresh in mind, um, look at the, uh, the uh, top uh, slide. If we have these three atomic operations and one is read and write and transfer, uh, and we therefore talk about readability and writeability and transferability of data, then we can extract just the ability of that data space. And we can then answer the question, what is the ability of the data space? We can do a little bit more um, just to go one step forward and try to have some qualitative, quantitative, uh, bit of uh, joke here, uh, ability of the data space. None, low, medium, high, full, just to have the, the usual uh, red and green. And if you attach some numbers, uh, zero to four, then the best data space you want to have is a data space that has ability, well, for no, trivial reasons. Four points for readability, four points for writability, and four points for transferability. It means that it's fully readable, fully writable, fully transferable in the read, write, and transfer that we have seen before. It's not just a you know, simple, as it were, unique uh, understanding, but in the, if you like, conceptually rich sense of these three operations. So well, all this just to set up the, uh, the last two slides, uh, or three, uh, sorry, um, problems. Because once we have the conceptual framework and we can actually speak the same language, then there are feasibility problems. There are feasibility problems. And we need to be careful about not considering them normative problems, technical, legal, and social. These are problems about the ability of our data space. For example, protocol, standards, security. Technical, as in technological, scientific, et cetera, feasibility. It's a matter of how good the ability of the data space is in terms of, for example, um, uh, protocols, legal, data protection, liability, and so on, uh, GDPR and everything else that you heard a million times, social market forces, public opinion. Uh, if something might be technical, technically feasible, legally uh, okay, but socially you know, unacceptable, you don't have a good data space anyway. So I put social at the bottom because I think that to be discussed that it's there that normally the pressure comes to being built so that the legal start changing and the technical makes a difference. So something that is technically feasible gets legally acceptable because society decides like, look, this is the way we want to go. COVID related challenges, for example. Now today we have a huge amount of data that in some corners, more or less, and we can discuss, may or may not become usable for future pandemics. Technically, very doable. Legally, mm, complicated. Socially, at least in this country, it didn't go down well, not at all. And that's why, for example, the app for COVID, the first one we developed uh, with the government, that was in the advisory board, failed completely for social reasons, not for legal and not for technical. That's the ability, feasibility problems, for example. And then we have another basket uh, of problems. Those are normative problems. And uh, I call them normative, I hope it doesn't get confused with the legal aspects that I mentioned before. Who controls the ability of the data space? What degrees of accountability? What levels of competition? A couple of examples very quickly uh, and we come to an end. Um, platforms controlling other platforms. If you think about it, this is about read, write and transfer. These operations and who says who can do what? When uh, Amazon, uh, for example, decided that uh, Parallel could not have any more space uh, and therefore de-platform uh, Parallel, uh, I'm sure, I assume everybody knows about now, there was a, um, 
the, uh, the disaster happened uh, in Washington uh, after Trump, et cetera, and so several people died and so on. Um, so deplatforming is a problem in the data space that has got to do with uh, who has the right to give what permissions to whom. Digital sovereignty, more broadly, is not uh, what previously mentioned uh, already, uh, is about precisely the ability of, of data space uh, as well. Who controls uh, the three operations in the rich sense that uh, we have seen before? So this is the end of this. Uh, no, kicking the ball. Uh, that's the slide slide. As I said before, uh, the, you can see why the new challenge is not digital innovation, but uh, the governance of digital. Um, in order to have governance of the digital, you need to have a good shape. So you need to have, for example, in our case, digital objects that work well, standards, protocols, the technical and scientific background, the legal uh, framework, the social acceptability. But what to do with all this and how to do it? Well, this is, it seems to me, is the ultimate problem that we need to face. And with this, uh, I thank you for your patience and I look forward to hearing uh, comments and feedback. Thanks a lot. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I, I think you um, you failed to disappoint us. That was uh, wonderful <laughs> and thought provoking. <laughs> so and now I would like to invite our uh, commenter, Sabina Leonelli. Um, if you have slides, feel free to share them. But uh, it's uh, not, of course, uh, important if you don't. Uh, we are going to have uh, a commenter uh, speak. We will have a chance for a quick reaction from the panelists. And then we will have a Q&A until the top of the hour. So again, feel free to use the Q&A tool and please upload the questions that you think are the most important to use with our finite time. Sabina Leonelli uh, serves as the co-director of the Exeter Center for the Study of the Life Sciences, where she leads the data studies research strand, the theme lead for the data governance, openness and ethics strand of the Exeter Institute for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence, and is a Turing Fellow at the Alan Turing Institute in London. She is also Editor-in-Chief of the International Journal, Journal History and Philosophy of the Life Sciences and Associate Editor for the Harvard Data Science Review. She serves as external faculty for the Conrad Lorenz Institute for the Advanced Study of Neural Complex Systems and has many other uh, very important roles. Uh, I would like to uh, um, invite her to uh, speak now. Thank you very much to everybody for the invitation. And of course, it's a great pleasure to be part of this very important discussion and to react on um, Luciano's wonderful comments. Um, as Luciano will fully expect, uh, this is not going to be a critical set of remarks because we tend to really agree on many of these key issues. Uh, but rather, I think my comments will um, really take off from the key message that Luciano has developed in his wonderful introduction, uh, which was the idea that actually when we're looking at the problem of data space, is we're looking at a challenging governance, not just technology. And in fact, governance is a really central issue in this kind of question. And so the question then becomes, what kind of governance do we want? And where do we look if this is um, what we're interested in thinking about when imagining what a future globalized data space may look like? Now, um, I think, well, of course, I completely agree with Luciano and his work has illustrated that wonderfully uh, around the, the extent to which digitalization has transformed society, I think that when we really focus on the question of a global data space, we're looking at um, something which has been imagined in many different ways throughout history, and certainly in the last, um, well, actually well over 2000, 2000 um, years. We can think about the real universal libraries that was already very popular in the ancient worlds. Um, it was, we can think about the ways in which colonial empires have uh, been built on the idea that actually circulating knowledge and goods uh, around the world would be um, you know, the key determinant of, of economic power. And we can think about, for instance, the ways in which neoliberal economics, well before the advent of computation per se, has imagined um, the ways in which free markets could be built over uh, information networks. And I think what's interesting uh, when one thinks just very, very briefly about these huge historical instances is the extent to which all of this actually have a common denominator. And this is the idea that data governance in these systems was never imagined as a democratic space. Um, so there was, of course, a very strong intuition, which I think still proves true, 
that who controls information has, um, you know, basically controls uh, political power and many other types of social power in society. Uh, but there was also the intuition that, in fact, uh, this can be done very effectively uh, for the benefit of some members of society without any recourse necessarily to democratic rule or any kind of benefit sharing mechanisms. So I think actually this we continue to see as a challenge uh, in contemporary society, uh, the idea that on the one hand, um, we want to think about data ownership um, and control as a subject of individual decisions. And we continue to think about data as items, objects to be traded and commodified in a variety of ways. Um, but at the same time, uh, there is a strong perception of individual agency in relation to how we act over this data, the kind of ability that uh, Luciano was referring to as shrinking more and more, since we are seeing few organizations actually taking control more and more of this large data space. Now, I think this has, uh, may have come as a bit of a shock, this realization that actually uh, even the data space we're looking at today is not necessarily a democratic one. Uh, a shock to many people who are really looking at information technology and the internet as something that would have a liberating power. And certainly uh, many people that I've been working with for years uh, who are in charge of stewarding data and building uh, data infrastructures around the world and are really trying to do this very much with the idea of doing it in a federated way, in a way that engages lots of different kinds of publics and actually empower society in a broader sense uh, to act for its own benefit. Uh, now, I think one of the key challenges that I want to throw back to the rest of the discussion, and of course, I really look forward to seeing what various panelists make of it, is this question around uh, what Luciano has called sovereignty and what I'm going to call ownership in a kind of more crass sense, if you want. The idea that uh, clearly, I think, um, for the construction of a well-functioning um, more democratic data space, uh, the idea of construing data as commodities uh, whose exchange can be regulated through some kind of contract really is not working very well. The idea of data as a common good seems to be a much better starting point. But then again, what does this mean? I think we have tried to delve through um, the complexities of what it means to open the data, to make all data available to anybody at every time. And we have very quickly realized that this is really not feasible. And in fact, what really is important is to make data accessible through these kinds of globalized data infrastructures to those that can realize lawful as well as socially beneficial uses of the data. And that, of course, then brings us back to the political issue. So who should be in charge in making these kinds of decisions? Um, which kind of, um, if you want, meta-level or even meso-level governance do we need uh, to achieve this kind of question, this, this kind of result? Now, I think uh, one of the things that we've seen over the decades of work um, that has already gone into trying to build a data space is um, a lot of examples of um, truly radical initiatives that really were trying to build a highly responsive, highly democratic data space with lots of uh, different stakeholders involved and lots of different potential uses um, envisaged uh, for the data. But I think uh, one of the issues sometimes may have been that focusing on standardization has sometimes come to the expense of thinking about the politics of that standardization. And I think this is the idea that you can keep these two activities distinct is an illusion. I mean, we know that as soon as we're thinking about standards, um, there are all sorts of questions around who are actually determining those standards and uh, questions of power relations and political relations between uh, those agents. And at the same time, um, we cannot really thinking, be thinking about the governance of data without focusing on these standards. So. Uh, you know, and that I think reflects um, some of the ideas that have now become quite entrenched to uh, discussions of data governance. For instance, the idea that just thinking about data access is really not the issue. And in fact, sometimes uh, posing the problem of data governance as a problem of data access may distract from the real issue, uh, which actually really is who decides how data is used and under which conditions does that happen. 
So I think for me, uh, one of the recommendations in thinking uh, around what, um, what a future data space could be and how do we think about this is to really try and place these kinds of politics as explicitly as possible in the middle of these discussions. Um, I think I've worked with a lot, lot of uh, absolutely wonderful um, uh, data stewards uh, in charge of um, really important uh, data infrastructures who have very often complained to me uh, privately sometimes that they've found themselves playing a political game that they didn't really envisage having to play when coming into this whole uh, question around what constitutes a global data infrastructure. And it seems to me that by now we need to just embrace the fact that we are looking at a problem which because it's so intrinsically about governance is a political issue uh, where we need to take firm stands on the kinds of values, social and political values we want to defend through this kind of data infrastructures and do that in a way that is very explicitly reflected in not just which standards we choose, but also how do we we get to decisions about standards and how those decisions are revised in a way that actually is uh, democratically accountable. Of course, uh, the devil is in the details and much could be said, said that about that, but there's no time for this at the moment, so I'll, I'll stop now and look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. You've also given us much to think about. Well, I would like to invite any of the panelists um, who would, who would like to respond to any of these issues raised will take perhaps about five minutes and then we'll look at the Q&A uh, from our participants. Yes, uh, I would like to take the floor if possible. Thanks. Sure. Um, the, so the, the challenge is the governance of the digital, said uh, Luciano. Uh, I'd like now to develop uh, this statement and say the challenge is the good governance of the digital, this is the first one. So we had in past time Machiavelli on, on one side talking about governance and uh, you remember him, and on the other side Guicciardini. What we need uh, is a good governance model. Uh, you, you referred to, to, um, to Freud. Freud uh, has uh, written a book which is called uh, um, taboo and, um, and totem, totem and taboo. And he mentioned that at that time, which, which is uh, more than 120, uh, so around 120 years ago, that uh, usually people spend 80% of their time on uh, uh, watching taboos, living in taboos. Uh, what we are experiencing now is that we are free of, from taboos and uh, go in, in, in uh, actions. Uh, um, so we should find some way uh, to find a good governance uh, in, in, a, in a way some in between, because uh, taboos, a taboo in, in our cases, uh, do not destroy research data. This is a taboo, um, but we need some principles. We could be preserve data, uh, give access to data, and uh, you see, at the moment we we lose and and uh, and forget the taboos, um, then we go into some kind of uh, losing orientation in this world. So having a good governance model is also understand the worth of uh, taboos, of principles, and then the related rules and uh, regulations. So thanks. Thank you. Do we have uh, comments from any of the other panelists? Yes, I would like to add uh, a comment. Uh, and actually, I would like to challenge uh, this opposition between governance and innovations, because it turns governance, in my uh, opinion, too much into a post factum issue, because uh, the technologies are uh, evolving rapidly. The big players are determining uh, that development creating a lot of path dependency. And if now governance comes at the end of those developments, it can best be a corrective. And shouldn't we at least understand the term governance as including uh, innovations in a direction that we want from uh, you know, a societal perspective? Uh, so society, not just as a corrective to an autonomous uh, technical and economic uh, development, but society actually as a driver. And wouldn't that imply that we need to talk more uh, uh, about steering and uh, curating uh, terms that Luciano also managed, uh, mentioned uh, than just about governance? 
Any last comments from the panelists before we turn to Q&A? Yeah, if I may, just a, a really quick remark, and 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 thank you, Jurgen. I think that was a that that that's that uh, I think it's an insightful remark. Um, you know, it may it 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 it, and I'm list, I'm looking at what uh, Louise Benino also commented on the chat, but it makes sense that we we not treat governance as a as a uh, an after the fact thing. Um, but it also strikes me that we're we're kind of conflating the governance of the of the data, such as it's 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 used for lawful as well as well as socially beneficial uh, uses, which Sabrina is making, which I think is important, from the governance of the infrastructure, which is basically a delivery mechanism, kind of uniform, integrated delivery mechanism. And I think I think looking at the the governance of each separately strikes me as 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 important. <clears throat> we have much to offer in the way of solutions, other than teasing those two apart. Excellent point. Uh, Luciano, please. Thank you. I, I, I guess I can make the point very briefly because I, I agree with all the uh, points that have been made so far. Um, um, I didn't want to bother you with uh, trivial remarks and uh, stating the obvious. So, but let me state the obvious. Uh, of course, good governance, not bad governance. Uh, <laughs> who on earth wants bad governance? So, yeah, point taken. And of course, governance comes in many flavors and kinds. Not, not to be stressed too much, not with this group, we all know. So uh, we can move uh, very fast to you know, the real meat of the uh, discussion. But I, again, I completely, fully agree. Good governance and governance comes in many flavors and kinds and concerns many different stages uh, of the technology and so on. And um, the point perhaps which needs to be uh, further uh, stressed on which again, I completely agree. I, I was hoping that the, the, the very first slide maybe was too early, uh, stressed that point sufficiently. Direction, didn't I say that? No, that was governance <laughs> as a control and direction. Uh, when you are on a ship, you need to know where you want to go. So by governance here, I mean 100%, not a post hoc, no, let's see how he went and then let's uh, no, patch up what went right and wrong. It's kind of a Hegelian moment at the end of the day for the philosophers among us. Not at all. Uh, it's an early day determination of when, which direction innovation should go. So normally in Brussels discussions, when people start talking and it flows here, oh, look, no, you can never catch up with innovation, legislation, government will always come late. You need to tell them that there is a story told by companies to make sure that we do not get the following distinction. One thing is to accelerate and the speed of uh, a particular uh, journey. Another thing is the direction of that journey. If you like where you're going, you can go as quickly as you like, now even faster. But hands on the wheel, that is governance. Foot on the pedal, that is innovation. So we can do all the innovation we want as long as we steer in the right direction. To me, that is the European way and the right way of doing stuff. So um, it looks to me that uh, uh, we are, in this particular case, uh, doing uh, quite a decent job uh, in uh, in the EU, uh, trying to steer and make sure that you know, whatever happens in innovation, and it could be a gazillion fantastic things, go you know, in the right direction towards that island that I was pointing uh, in the platonic uh, slide. But I conclude, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think that's a good segue for a question that got several upvotes. Comes from Eric Schultes, who, who uh, res responds to uh, your prompt, Luciano, that says the new challenge is not digital innovation, but the governance of the digital. He asks if you can comment on centralized versus distributed governance in this context. Oh, happily, thank you. And again, uh, a very crucial point. Um, so, um, if we if we use the same word, centralized, decentralized, or distributed, or uh, um, one one issue that I think, or, let's say two, uh, that is worth uh, investigating uh, carefully is um, we can have hybrid models. We don't have to go for one or the other. Uh, uh, in fact, hardly ever uh, in any bit of society, you just get one or the other full stop. I'd be more uh, sort of, uh, models where you have a bit of uh, both. That sounds uh, to me uh, the way to go, but especially for the computer scientists among us, uh, with a high degree of decentralization, 
comes a high degree of coordination. The more the bits are doing their own business, the more carefully uh, the director of the orchestra, if you like, has to interact with every player to make sure that it's not a cacophony of things, but it's actually leading to a you know, good result according to plans. So I would um, uh, stress the importance of coordination when we are adopting a decentralized, uh, highly decentralized uh, government system, uh, something that we don't need so much in, of course, a centralized system which has this particular bonus. Now, uh, it seems to me that society, therefore, and that's the conclusion, uh, requires um, increasingly uh, high levels of coordination, precisely because um, some of the cultural trends that we have, at least in some corners of the world, Europe included, go towards decentralization, which in my own view is, is a good thing. But we need that counterbalance. Without the coordination, what you get, and let me be clear, for example, in terms of COVID, uh, um, since these are the days, you know, COVID reaction, no, reaction or strategic reactions at a European level, towards COVID. If we all go you know, our own way and you know, my data, your data, my app, your app, and it's a mess, there is no coordination, all that decentralization, which could be a good thing, becomes also uh, a bug, not a feature. To be a feature, coordination is required. The next question comes to us from Munaza Andrabi, who asks, aren't the three operations, readability, writeability, transferability, et cetera, equivalent to what FAIR encompasses? I must confess that while uh, that question was popping up, I went to check the website. Uh, so if I sound like I, I know my whole <laughs> just in front of me, uh, not really. Um, uh, principles, findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability. These are, to some extent, uh, read uh, and transfer, not so much writing. Uh, I think behind this wall, you find read, write, and transfer. But I don't want to you know, end up with a, a kind of a semantic dispute. I'm happy to go with whatever makes sense in terms of broad and uh, shared terminology. Uh, if that makes sense to people, uh, just say, look, no, to me, it sounds like this uh, language. So I'm happy to go with uh, that particular translation if that is helpful. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes to us from Hans Guther Dobreiner. He asks, how do we develop a feeling for good or bad data, given the fact that we cannot even value our present material ecosystems? Thus, what are the right principles to follow and how to agree on them? I think that uh, if you remember those, uh, uh, the, the problems that I, I, I call normative, broadly speaking, uh, uh, and, and the ones that I call uh, more sort of um, uh, technical, or, uh, um, it is only when there is sufficient uh, societal interest slash pressure that then things really not only change, but take roots. Um, there are some funny places uh, uh, where you can check you know, old photographs of old technology. And then you discover, for example, that we have had electric cars recharging in the United States for almost a century. Did you ever see them around? Well, they didn't take. Now they do. Uh, First versions of uh, uh, Steve Jobs uh, tried to produce in terms of an iPad was a complete disaster. Too early, wrong, uh, the advertisements are so funny. You can speak directly to your printer. Yeah, that was a, a, a different world. It didn't quite work. No social interest, no social pressure, no market uh, mechanism. So I think that we need to, um, forgive me for the philosophical moment, but we need to go even more higher up, uh, as it were, in the process to change the conditions of possibility of what's going to happen downwards. If we change the social appetite, interest, or, or even, for example, uh, level of um, skepticism, fears, uh, desires, then further down, you have uh, a completely different kind of outcome. One example, um, uh, since we're talking about data portability in the right context, et cetera, um, just quite rightly, Sabina uh, stressed the uh, individual ownership um, uh, of, of data, et cetera. Sometimes, and this is a specific example, especially in political context where you know, with policy or lawmakers, you find the following uh, picture. It's the individual and someone who holds the, the, the say the bank, okay? uh, holds the, uh, the individual or uh, hosts the individual uh, uh, data. It's not like that. It's actually the individual, one bank and another bank. 
And the portability of the data of the individual works, not because the individual is going to take the data from one, one place and bring them elsewhere, but because it enables the other bank to exploit competition to ask the first bank that it has to have its data and I have the data now. In other words, in this country, for example, you change utilities with one click, not because I go from one so, uh, electricity provider to another and I do hours of work downloading, uploading, no, 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 no. I just say, yes, please behave in such a way that I don't have to do anything and you take the contract from here to there. There are three people, not two, so interaction. That is, to me, one possibility, uh, among many others, I'm sure, of getting closer to what the question was asking. In other words, you start valuing things also when you don't have to do anything to make sure that their value pays back. You have to make an effort for their value to make a difference, you don't do it. If I'm enabling competition to make sure that someone who has an interest in getting the data work harder, for example, discount or something or whatever, uh, you get uh, your medicine faster, NHS, blah, blah, blah. Well, then there is a chance that actually we weren't going to see a good space here that works properly. But I agree that with the question, uh, I got the impression, the implicit assumption that at the moment we're not there, not yet. Uh, there is not enough interest. The next question comes from Yuri Demchenko, who asks, uh, all, for all of the panel, uh, your opinion, if data spaces have any philosophical concept. I oh, spoke too much, so I can shut up. <laughs> please, Sabina. Yeah, so I think it, that's a great question, of course, and it allows me to go back to a few other points that have come up so far. Of course, I couldn't agree more also with Luciano's interpretation as what I also meant, uh, that governance here is something that underpins every single point of contact with the data. I mean, this is something that certainly doesn't come a posteriori, but there's a set of decisions and evaluated decisions that are taken any moment um, it data have been dealt with and decisions have been made about them, uh, that really is very important to try and put up front and, and discuss as much as possible. So I think um, one of the potential issues I may have with the idea of data spaces, if one takes of it uh, as a visionary um, a concept, is how flat uh, this concept is, right? So the fact that there is a danger that thinking about data space, data infrastructures as a data space gives us the sense that what we're looking at here is some sort of container. And the container can be neutral, right? It's the kind of thing that's there. We fill it with stuff. We take stuff out. But really, you know, I mean, in a sense, as, as Beth has put it in, in her remarks, it's a delivery mechanism so that, uh, you know, we put in, we put stuff, put stuff out. There are questions of design that may play a role, but ultimately, you know, we're looking at a more or less neutral territory. And I guess my remarks, and, and I would um, interpret Luciano's remark also going that uh, direction, is that that really is very unhelpful in my view, as a way of thinking about uh, this problem. Because, I mean, you know, I've been doing um, work on very specific historical philosophical work with infrastructure for many years now. The one thing that's been clear in every single case I've analyzed is that these are not neutral structures. Um, people are making big decisions about what counts as data, what counts as good data, which is another um, question that has come up. Um, in the Q&A. And this is constantly iterated. Indeed, it needs to be constantly re-examined. But this decision are, you know, to an extent, political also. They're not just decisions about technically uh, what may count as good data. They're a decision about towards which audience, towards which use are this data acceptable, are this data uh, usable. And so I think that's, uh, for me, that's really an important starting point for this discussion that I've been involved so often in discussions about, for instance, open data, where the big issue was, how do we get to the data, right? And there was much less attention on these design issues and governance issues around how are we channeling the data? What kind of uses are we um, promoting? And I think that's, that's an important philosophical conceptual shift that I think should be happening. So a, a follow up some of the other points discussed from Barbara Magana, who asks, if coordination of distributed governance is the answer, who will coordinate this? Let me just jump in and say, Sabrina, thank you for that clarification. I, I really appreciate that perspective. Yes. And I agree with you at that intersection. So I'll stop there. Are we going back to the 
Sure. Well, who, yeah. So with distributed governance, maybe who will or who should drive that? Okay. So just a quick comment that I saw in the in the chat that I misunderstood the fair question. So I apologize for that. Um, indeed, as one of the uh, commentators said, embarrassing my misunderstanding. Apologies. Uh, back to uh, the uh, uh, coordination. Um, that's a classic problem. We have what has who, who controls the controllers, etc. I think at that point uh, you need to close the loop and and go back to society. Uh, in the same sense in which the it is society that controls those com who control society. So uh, you delegate power, say, to politicians, but then it's society that controls the delegated power. So to make sure that if it doesn't work, it goes back to the people, vote differently, etc. You, you go back to the cycle. I think this is a similar case, seems to me, where uh, a uh, democratic mechanism of uh, giving uh, not control, checking that the control is uh, exercised properly, and then in case, you know, re uh, reinstall or uh, revise, uh, modify, but in a cycle whereby uh, those who are being coordinated and controlled are also in charge ultimately for the controlling uh, in question. It, it is not uh, in any sense paradoxical, it's just a feedback mechanism, it seems to me. Uh, so I don't see this as a, oh, it's surely this cannot work because it's a, you know, it's a vicious circle. No, it's a virtual cycle, uh, whereby you know, uh, do that for a certain amount of time, and through time, the cycle comes back in, into sort of uh, constructive loops. Um, otherwise, we end up yeah, into uh, no, controllers or controllers or controllers or controllers. Or controllers. And this is sort of uh, uh, going back to uh, someone who miraculously should start uh, kicking the whole uh, sort of process. Thank you. So I would uh, like to close out the session with one last question. Uh, Luciano, you mentioned that all the new callers are green and you mentioned stewardship. Mark Wilkinson uh, writes, the recognition of the gap between the number of capable stewards and the global need for them is important and worrisome to me. How do you think we can close that gap? This is a fundamental point. Uh, we find that point uh, sort of translated into um, lack of um, uh, right forms of uh, even higher education skills and so on. Um, it's, it seems to me, but then again, I don't want to be too optimistic, due to the uh, fast pace uh, of this transformation. If you uh, have a long-term perspective in terms of uh, the other two, to me, similarly, gigantic transformation in human history, you know, the, the agriculture and the industrial. If the digital is of the same size and magnitude as well, in terms of importance, then the agriculture took millennia, the, 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 the industrial took centuries. This one is taking decades. So a bit of misalignment and lack of balance is to be, I would say, expected. Hopefully, uh, as we put in place you know, ways of retraining or uh, reskilling or changing completely what we expect society to be able to do, then the stewardship will be something that will be uh, done properly by say a couple of generations from now. But it is true that at the moment we are completely off balance. Essentially we're coming out of uh, the, the 20th century with a certain sense of post-industrial perspective. And all of a sudden we are you know, through a quite quick paced revolution in need of skills and abilities and even mindsets that are very different from what we would have expected only say uh, past generation, I mean the generation of my parents. So um, not to be too optimistic, but maybe if we give ourselves a, a bit of time and we cut a bit of slack uh, with the right efforts and, and policies, we'll get there. It will just take a little bit longer, a generation or two. Thank you so much. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Demetrius to introduce our next speaker. Thank you very much, Christine. It's 